you interned at Target while you were in college. How was your experience at Target? Some of the soft skills that I gained from working at Target really helped me in my career. Yeah, so I feel like I took a lot away from Target, but at the same time, I realized that that wasn't the direction that I wanted to go into, but it taught me different skills that I could take away sales, human resources. I really enjoyed the HR department for some reason and which I'm doing HR now as well. Great experience if you ever want to get into it. So how was that navigating the pandemic as a new graduate? Cause I know it was pretty tough. Yeah, I feel like I already secured a job before I graduated. When the pandemic did hit, I believe it was like March of 2020. I was already like almost a year into corporate America working at M&T Bank at the time. We had to transition. It was very difficult because I was working in the branch at the time and we had to transition immediately to do, what is it, the PPP loans. We were doing that and I, I had a hand in helping with the PPP loans and securing that for businesses. All right, so if you was getting 70, 80, I'm assuming you took a large jump and you could just say TC so you don't have to say base. Yeah, so in terms of salary change, I went from like that 80K base to making six figures now, it's base salary, stocks, and then also sign on payments and bonuses along with any types of commissions or things that come along with that. This video is being brought to you by Course Careers. What's going on guys? If you're looking to start your IT career, then check out the IT course at Course Careers taught by none other than the great Josh Medical. I'm pretty sure you heard of him. But we all know that it could be pretty pricey getting to IT and this course is very affordable. And also, if you don't wanna pay back those student loans like I have to, <laughs> then this is the course for you. So check out the Course Careers course. My link will be in the description. Use code TEXTUAL50 in order to get $50 off of your course and get started on your IT career today. All right, so before we started recording, you was telling me about you were really into sports. So what are some of the sports that you're into? Yeah, sure. So I'm into volleyball, bowling, and I used to do track and field, um, outdoor and indoor, <laughs> basically in high school. So I stopped doing that because... I don't got it no more like that to be <laughs> to be running, but definitely um, volleyball is something that I you know really do enjoy and as a pastime. Cool. What about uh, basketball? You know, I tried basketball in the sixth grade. <laughs> that didn't work out well. Um, so like they would rarely put me in, and then when they did, <laughs> I didn't even make any shots. And then I just remember making like one shot the whole season, and like I just that was the best I could do at the time. <laughs> so. Basketball is not there. <laughs> I mean, do you watch it? Like, like, uh, do you like? I know like the different teams, but I'm not too into basketball or watching sports specifically. Okay, you know, if you get a an, another boo or something, they may want to know about that. But <laughs> right, <laughs> that's like a first question. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Textual Talk Podcast. I'm your host, HD, where we break down everything that has to do with tech, careers, advice, you name it. And today we are joined by the lovely Venetia Morris. And I probably butchered her name because I'm talking fast, but Venetia Morris. And if you haven't noticed her, she's on TikTok. She also works for a big tech company right now. She has a lot of experience and we're going to get into it in the episode. And primarily some of her experience resonates with me because she worked at a place that I used to work at. So I love when people used to work at Big Red. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, let's introduce our guest. Yeah. Hi, guys. My name is Venetia Morris, and I'm currently a talent acquisition recruiter um, in tech. And I recently started posting on TikTok about well, fully a year ago, but then when I started doing the career advice and all that stuff on TikTok, it was back in November when I started taking it seriously. And then since then, I was really pleasantly surprised that a lot of people had questions about career and um, wanted to understand the job search process. So I've made my, my channel primarily about that, but I also do lifestyle content to show a day in my life or things that I do or really just 
food stuff, just random things as well. But the main focus is career because I realized that, you know, especially in black community and marginalized communities that are, is that people, they want to get into like top tech companies. They want to, you know, understand the process and there's not a lot there's a lot of information on the internet but there's just not a lot of access for us um so i just really wanted to um you know just present that on my TikTok, and then you know since i've had the tech side of things where i'm a recruiter and i see that and i've also had the job search um thing as well you know i've been in the job search process and i see both sides so i really wanted to present that on my TikTok um so that you guys can understand the process a little bit more and hopefully i can provide some insight that's dope so how many years of experience do you have like overall like in your career right now well i graduated in 2019 so that's about four years of experience and um, a lot of people would say that, you know, that's not a lot of experience or whatever. Um, you know, I'm relatively new to corporate America, but at the same time, I would say that it is good enough, especially when you're seeing the ins and outs of the hiring process. Um, you see how hiring managers think, and then you also understand yourself as a job searcher as well. You understand the hardships of going through job search and even being a college student trying to find a job as well, you know? Yeah, I definitely agree. And I like that, you know, it's pretty much been, what, four years since you've been in, like, college. I think that's pretty good. I think that still puts you in a place where, yeah, you're kind of new, but you're not. But you still can resonate with the college people versus an old head like me. <laughs> so uh, I, I definitely agree with you. And I believe that your experience of also recently being in college, being new to corporate America, some of the things that you recently experienced that you could probably help other people yeah, kind of yeah. mitigating their career, like kind of for me, it's like a different time because I've seen that some of the talks on on Twitter will be like, "Hey, don't listen to these veterans in the game. The game has changed, and all this yada yada okay. yada stuff." It's a lot of like back and forth, especially when it comes to technical roles. We just every it's probably like every like four or five weeks, certs and degrees come up, or do I get all these certs and all these other things? And the people like me that have like 10 years or we got people that have five plus years. We're saying, Hey, we don't care about them degrees when we interview y'all just focus on learning how to do the stuff. And then you got the people that's trying to get in. Nah, I'm get all the certs and all this other stuff. And uh, like you, I see it both ways, but since I've been doing a career coaching thing, I work with people that have like certifications and it, they have like some limitations because they just focus on the certs and not the skills. And that's what we're trying to t convey to people. And then some people get their pennies in a bunch because They've invested a lot of money into these certifications and it kind of makes them feel away when we talk about these subjects. But I want to ask you, what's a random fact about you that no one would know? Like what's some rant so random about you? <laughs> a random fact. Um, I went to 13 different schools growing up, 13 to 14 different schools growing up. So that's, <laughs> that's pretty random in like different countries and states not military at all <laughs> that was gonna be my next question i was like you know families in the midst that's cool so you're mm -hmm. an actual nomad yeah i mean not by choice at that time um it's just like due to circumstances but you know coming from jamaica moving to california moving to arizona just like <laughs> so many different things yeah where were you born and raised and I could actually slide that in right there. It's like, okay, so being from Jamaica, I know like it's a it's a culture shock when you come from there and you come here because it's different. It, it it really is different. And then you have to learn how to assimilate and all those different things. And then you have your your heritage and how you you know your ethics and morals about things, how you feel about things. And then as you get into an, being an adult, it's even different when you have to experience some of the things you experience. Like, nah, this is. Mm -mm, this, this is not it so even though that wasn't a question i kind of want you to talk about that like actually being like jamaican being in corporate also you know coming here as a, as a young lady or a young girl how was that for you that experience yeah um it was it was a shock it was a hundred percent shock because when you're in jamaica it's like 
at the age that I was at, you, like you don't really understand certain things. You don't really understand how the world works or anything like that. Um, and when I was born in Jamaica, you know, it's <laughs> I was born in a little yard um, with my family, like 12 people live in one yard. Um, and it's like everybody has their own houses. So it was completely different. When I came to America, the first place I went to was California. And California is completely different than New York. So then um, I had to assimilate to California and I I was like the always like the only black girl in my class and I had a white stepfather <laughs> and um, it was just like everything was so different to me then and then I moved to Arizona again like the only black person in my class um, and just trying to understand like who I was and also what the heck is going on in this world <laughs> or in this state that I'm in or in the U.S. because you know, when you're coming from Jamaica, they're telling you, oh, go to foreign, like, you know, this is the best thing to go to America or whatever. But at the same time, it's like, you're trying to understand, okay, what's so good <laughs> about it? Like, you know, at a young age. So then moving to New York, that was like even more of a cult culture shock because then I was surrounded by Jamaicans again and my family again, and then different people again. So I don't know. I, I just feel like that has made me who I am and has made me extremely adaptable. Um, and then also has allowed me to understand myself and even, you know, be more in tune with my roots of being Jamaican and just being very proud to be Jamaican as well. I think that's pretty cool. I mean, that's a unique experience. So you did high school in New York, right? I did high school in New York. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, one of my questions was about kind of you being in high school, we talked about like you did sports in high school. What did you want to be like going into college? For me, it, I wanted to be, well, I went through phases young, early on in life. I wanted to be a wrestler. Then after that, I decided, you know what? I want to be an architect. And I changed that to going into like IT. For you, what did you want to do when it came to being in high school? I had no idea <laughs> what I wanted to do. And it drove me crazy because um, I just, I, at one point I thought I wanted to be a news reporter. I knew I never wanted to do like the traditional job, like, you know, doctor, lawyer, teacher, like what, you know, basically Nigerians, Jamaicans and immigrant families tell you to be. I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, but I, I, I like the idea of being a news reporter because I like to speak. I like to travel or go different places. And, you know, so I thought that would be a good idea. But then I was like, yeah, they don't make money. <laughs> so I was like, I, I don't want to do that. I saw that, you know, entry is like $20,000. And I'm like, yeah, I need to be able to eat. So <laughs> um, that went out the window. And then when I, you know, got to college, I switched my major like, so many different times um, because I had this um, idea. I'm like, okay, I need to make my family proud, but I also need to do something that I love and I'll be damned if I like get stuck in something um, that I don't like. So, <laughs> so then, you know, I chose psychology and political science because I genuinely enjoyed it. And then my parents were like, what are you going to do with that? And I'm like, I don't know. We'll figure it out <laughs> as I go. So I, I just always had the knowing that I was going to be okay at the end of it. You know, I agree. I think for 18 year olds, it's a lot on them to ask them about what they want to do for the rest of their life. I think that's a lot. Oftentimes, a lot of people or sometimes the first time generation college kids or we just been told, go be a doctor, go be a lawyer, go do this, go do that. I'm not really realizing that some of the people don't even like those careers that they chose. They just did it. They just did it because it made them a lot of money and, you know, it's ha it has the prestige with it. But there's been a new, t like a, a tide has been changing. Now you have people either being entrepreneurs, influencers, they are doing stuff in tech or startups, or investors, whatever, right? And they're making, some of them are making money like they're doctors and lawyers. Well, actually, Contrary to popular belief, depending on what type of lawyer you are and how much experience you have, you don't always make that much money. I think a lot of people have a misconception about being lawyers. Like they don't just start off making a lot of money. You could go do another route and make more money. That's why 
when I got to school and I, th- I found out stuff about architecture and I wasn't as gifted as other people when I looked into it and I seen that what they were trying to start them off at for all the work, I said, oh no, I'm not, I'm not finna do all this work for architecture to be making like 40K. I was like, I can go do something easier and come out and make 40K. Really? And that's, that's the thing. It's like, you go to school for all these years and then you do something. You don't even know if that's what you fully want to do. And that's just not the path that I'm willing to take. And a lot of people like, don't really understand that tech is a thing out there. Um, You know, I was speaking to this one girl, my friend um, who's studying to becoming a doctor, his sister. And he was, she was just like, yeah, I'm 29. I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. And I don't want to be a doctor like my brother and my parents. And it's like, I feel forced to get into that because I don't know what else is out there. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of opportunities and it's just tapping into that. Yeah. Funny enough though, even the brief bit of skills that she probably learned, like trying to pursue a medical career could be translated over to some type of healthcare type of company where she could actually do something she might be more passionate about with, you know, less stress. So that's what I'm all about. Like when I have consultations with different people and they tell me what they're currently doing, I say, hey, well, let's look in this industry. So I have a client like right now, I think he's already working at a healthcare company and he's doing like uh kind of like help desk stuff. But based on his skills and kind of the path that I helped him with. Now we're doing, we're still looking at the healthcare industry, but the, the roles are paying more because they're different roles. So it's like, you're already in healthcare. They're probably going to be more inclined to interview you because you understand it. You already understand HIPAA, high trust, NIST, PCI, all this different crap you got to do when it comes to healthcare data. So that's kind of like a little nugget for the people out there when they're looking, what are my transferable skills and what am I supposed to do? You know, people are trying to, unfortunately, they're trying to, no offense to you, but they're trying to be like you. They want to start over and go to big tech right away when they can go get a bag somewhere else and get their experience up. And people don't really understand how, and I noticed because I did it the other day on the, on the TikTok, I I screenshot a blonde, how I was saying like pretty much they had a kind of manipulated some people to come back into the office with return to office and not realizing like some of the bigger companies rule like with an ironclad fist. It's like, how dare you say you don't want to do what, you know, Meta, Amazon, Google, Apple, whoever, how did de- Netflix, how dare you say you don't want to do what we want to do? Like that's kind of sometimes you got to go into that. And then a lot of people, the prestige of even working at those companies, because you know, people, like you said, New York, California, mm-hmm. people wearing their badges out. Oh yeah, I'm big time. I'll work at so-and-so. Yeah. It, it, it's a lot. And I experienced that from when I used to work at Goldman Sachs. Mm-hmm. Like I found out when I left, people were like, oh, how dare he want to leave? Like, I was like, I mean, hey, y'all was blessed to have me. Right. I don't care about y'all. Like that's why I tell people to realize, realize too. And we may get to some of that in, in a little bit. I want to stay on topic because then we'll just start <laughs> be rambling off, but it probably would still be good regardless. Yeah. So let's talk about you going to Union College. Kind of what made you choose Union College and how was that college experience? Yeah. Um, so what made me choose it? It was, I did an early decision and they were offering me a full ride. <laughs> so um, I actually, I visited the school way before um, I had to make a decision and I met someone in admissions and he was willing to advocate for me. Um, I definitely wanted the liberal arts college education because I feel like I was in a place where I had no idea what I wanted to do and I kind of wanted to dibble and dabble into different things. Um, So, you know, I I chose it because, you know, obviously the money, getting away from my parents, like, (laughs) you know, like going away, but not too far away, still in the New York, um, you know, hemisphere and everything. But um, I think that it had a great program. It's one of the top liberal arts schools out there. And, you know, I I thought it was a great um, opportunity at that time. And, you know, I'm the only person in my family that went to even went to college in the first place. So just even being able to choose where I wanted to go um, was kind of difficult as well. Um, If I could go back, you know, I would expand my options a little bit more, um, not like knowing what I know now, but I feel like your, where you study doesn't fully matter um, unless you're like doing something to get into grad school or something to get into like something else. Like I feel like where you go to school, like, yeah, it can open doors and opportunities for networking, but it doesn't really matter. Um, In terms of my union college experience, I feel like 
it was a great experience because like I said, I changed my major so many different times and I was able to do that because um, it gave me that flexibility. So at one point I was neuroscience. Um, at one point I was like econ. Um, and I was able to like really take those classes and really figure out, do I like this? Do I not? And, and keep it pushing and even make my own major as well. That was something that was exciting. But I think my experience at Union College opened me to being able to even start my TikTok uh, when I look back in hindsight, because I used to work in the career center as my work study. And I would sit there and take in everything I possibly could to learn about the job search process and the career process. Um, because I'm like, at the end of this, I need to secure a job. Um, so I need to see and understand what's going on. So, you know, I worked in the career center and I helped other peers with resumes. I saw firsthand, like what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Um, so I'm really, really grateful for that experience. And then even being able to tie that into being a recruiter now, seeing from both sides, like what they teach you versus what you should actually do um, as well. So love my college experience um, as well. That's dope. And I'm glad that you answered that question about, you know, being a first gen college kid, because it's, it's tough. I mean, you don't have anybody to guide you and navigate you over some of the pitfalls. Like, one of my shorts, I was talking to my, well, now I have another baby brother that's about to start. So I have two brothers in college. They're doing their own thing. But mm -hmm. I'm there as a lifeline. I try to give them a path, but at the same time, you got to let kids live their life. Right. But that's the benefit of them having somebody who has a bachelor's and a master's now who went through school, mm -hmm. did undergrad 10 years ago, and can tell you, hey, do this, this, and this in the summer. By December, hopefully we should be able to get some right. internships right. You know, early on into your freshman year. So we get internships like every year for three, four years. Mm -hmm. When you get to the market or you might not even make it to the market, they might offer you before then you have a full time job. A lot of us are playing the game backwards. Yeah. You know, like for me, they told me, oh, go to the career fair your junior year. <laughs> Mind you. My school wasn't even known for like IT stuff. So it was already mm -hmm. a crappy career fair. Right. So it, it was no benefit. They weren't helping me. In a sense, saying, oh, well, apply to the, all these internships, you know, elsewhere, like all these different things are tell me what type of skills to learn. Like those those are the things that they're not really teaching you when it comes mm -hmm. to college, especially curriculums, where if you're listening and you're in college right now, whatever role you think you might want, please use social media, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Use one of those mediums to find somebody that you want to be like and ask them what you need to learn ahead of time. So you can save yourself a lot of heartache and being miserable that you just spent four years in school and feel like you didn't learn something. I'm telling you, it sucks. I think you just said something so important. The major key is like really talking to people and really understanding what their experience has been like, understanding what you're getting yourself into. And I feel like network, you, you can see that as networking is, but it's like really making connections. That's what networking is. Um, and really understanding and seeing and talking and being around those people already in the fields that you are thinking about or even that you want to be in as well. So, yeah. Yep. And now what I want to talk about briefly is you interned at Target while you were in college. Now, I was trying to remember what number my store was. It might have been like 13, 87, 13, something. I don't know, because that's the code we, the code we have to put in to get into the door uh, in the break room. But uh, how was your experience at target because i'm so biased like i if i i don't really like going to walmart if i do a short like i will stay in target like all day because i, I worked that through college but some of the soft skills that i gained from working at target really helped me in my career you know you think about it, you go on target people gonna ask you hey can i help you find something you go on walmart they can see you looking for you know five minutes they ain't gonna ask you nothing you're just gonna keep on walking you gotta go up to them <laughs> so Honestly, how was that experience at Target and do you think that it helped benefit your career? Yeah, sure. Wait, before I jump in, what was your role at Target? I did hard lines. Oh, you did hard lines? Were you like the executive, you know? Okay. So no, so I was only, uh, um, uh, what you call it? I was only like just a team member because I worked really in between school and I never, and that's the thing too, I never applied to do the intern thing because- I was already a team member and I didn't want to be uh, an ETL. That was like last resort. Last resort for me to say, you know what? Hey, I know I can get 
I think they were paying like they manager 60, 70, 80,000, whatever they was paying them. So I was like, I know I could be a manager somewhere at Target just because I didn't work whatever year and I got a degree because that's all you really needed, like degree and whatever. And they'll let you be an ETL. But that was like the last thing that I wanted to do. Gotcha. OK, so um, when I initially got into Target, I was already thinking about doing something within marketing Um sales. Um, you know, this is towards the end of my college journey. So I think like junior going into senior year. So I already had an idea of like kind of what I wanted to do. So when I did the ETL, so it's the executive team lead internship, I thought that I was going into, um, you know, like the corporate, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then I later found out that it was actually the stores, which I'm like, okay, yeah, I can do, I can do the stores. And the way that they sold it to me was that, you know, you're going to be getting exposed to like the different parts of the stores, which is going to give you skills within sales, marketing, um, all these different things, uh, general merchandising. So I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sold on it. And I really think just looking back, it did give me those skills. It, it, well, I'm going to get into that after, but how was it as a whole and, and what did I do? I was able to shadow different departments within the stores. So everything from human resources to, you know, the clothing um, to soft lines, hard lines, the baby. I was in charge of the baby department, electronics, like everything um, Target provides. I was able to shadow the people who were leading those departments and understand what they do, as well as the ins and outs of every single department, which was invaluable. Um, I had a mentor. I had support. I had people um, that I could easily go to. But I think that the reason why it didn't work out for me is because it goes back to passion. I, I just really wasn't passionate about like working in a store. Um, and it just wasn't for me in that sense. But I did take away a lot from it. Um, I learned the importance of data. Um, being data driven, um, utilizing, they had these little phone thingies um, that you could look through and um, see what what the most selling product, the most, uh, what is it? The, the product that sold the most as well. Uh, so yeah, so I feel like I took a lot away from Target, but at the same time, I realized that that wasn't the direction that I wanted to go into, but it taught me different skills that I could take away sales, you know, human resources. I really enjoyed the HR department for some reason, and which I'm, you know, doing HR now as well. So great experience if you ever want to get into it, but you have to decide for yourself if that's something you want to do um, instead of getting stuck in something. So that's something I, I really wanted to stay away from. Got it. Um, so I say you didn't want to work in the store. That's kind of my sentiments as well. Yeah. But have you ever questioned like going to work uh, in Minnesota? You don't have to go to Minnesota, but you know, that's where headquarters is. So I mean, corporate. You know, I would be open if it's something in the corporate offices, just not in the stores. I feel like Target as a whole, I just love the culture. I love their thought process on the guests. We call them guests, not customers. You know, just like just everything from how they think about guests, how they structure the stores, because, you know, they, they structure it to keep you in there. <laughs> so... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. So I feel like Target over Walmart any day. I went to Target like three times this week. So, you know, I still love the company. I used to tell people back in the day, like, look, me taking you to Target is a love language right there. Listen, you ain't been on a Target run with me. I, I might not like you that much, to be honest. Matter of fact, Target, anybody from Target in the marketing department, if y'all watching this, you want to sponsor some future episodes, tune in because we, we we right here standing for target but i only bought up minnesota because last year i was interviewing for a role at target and i actually really wanted it only because i saw the storyline i could make for us like i used to do hard lines and came back 10 years later to be the lead c -cert analyst for target so that was going to be pretty cool because i was working at target when they had the big breach in 2013 so i remember that so i knew I was going to go to the the second round, but then they had to close the wreck because, you know, the economy started like crapping on itself. And I think they opened it back up. I don't even know if they hired somebody for it yet. But I know the recruiter had spent the block on me about it. But that was going to be one of the selling points that I told the, when it came to the technical things like, you know, 
unlike maybe some of your other applicants, I seen firsthand of what happens, you know, at Target, especially a trusted brand when like something happens and, you know, it'll be my mission to uphold to make sure we don't have any data exfiltration or anything like that to make sure like, you know, I'm always on 10 when I'm at work. But you know, this isn't, you know, a Target commercial or a sponsorship. You know, we can we can we can set up a, a live stream and talk about Target one day. I mean, if we got to. So how was it after college? So you got out in 2019 and for you, that means you were headed to now. Did you get out in 2019 in the summer or did you get out in the, the fall of 2019? OK, so that means you had I ain't gonna lie. That was probably like my last fun summer. 2019 was. And then, you know, the next year we get the, well, towards the end of the year, pandemic. So how was that navigating the pandemic as a new graduate? Because I know it was pretty tough. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I already secured a job before I graduated. So I think that that was, excuse me, that was pretty, you know, if I had to find a job like during the pandemic, that would have been even harder. But I secured it um, about like, six to seven months before I graduated working in the career center um, as well in my school. So that helped me out a lot. But, you know, when the pandemic did hit, I, I believe it was like March of 2020, I was already like almost a year into corporate America, um, you know, working at m and Bank at the time. So, you know, it, it, we had to transition. It was very difficult because I was working in the branch at the time and we had to transition immediately to do, what is it? The PPP loans. We were doing that. And I I had a hand in helping with the PPP loans and securing that for businesses as well as um, personal, you know, like just like securing those things as well. And I I got excited about that and then excited about the opportunity to work from home because they sent everyone home to work on the PPP. So that was like my first taste of, virtual working and um, all that stuff. So um, <laughs> that was that was super exciting. And once I had that taste, I did not want to go back into an office. So I immediately transitioned into a different role where I could work from home. And, you know, when I even switched to my current company now, you know, that helped with the work from home. So I feel like in terms of the transition as a college graduate, it wasn't hard for me particularly, but you know, it would have been harder if probably I didn't have something at the time. That's dope. Cause that's one of my next questions was going to be about was you um, working at M&T bank, but I wanted to actually get some fun stuff in here before we get back into the serious stuff. So if anybody has followed her on TikTok, she loves to travel and it looks like, I'm not going to lie. I enjoy like traveling solo too, because I don't have to worry about, I want to go do this. I'm going to do that. Like when it's solo, I can just do what I want to do. If I want to lay in the bed all day, then get up and, you know, go work out or do what I can do that. You know, it's perfect for me. Like, I feel like, you know, you got to have your solo trips and then you have to be prepared for the trips where y'all got an itinerary where you do something. But uh, for you so far, what's been like the your favorite place that you've traveled to? I would say, I would say this is a two part thing. Um, the Netherlands is one of my favorite places. And then um, in in the Caribbean, definitely just keep going back to Jamaica. That's always going to be like my go-to. <laughs> so the Netherlands, Jamaica, I just feel like even like just going to other countries, I feel like everywhere has their own little culture. And I, I just really find something to enjoy in each and every place that I've been. So, I mean... Yeah, if I had to choose those two, I think that that would be it. Got it. So have any of those places travel been a vacation? A ba- I <laughs> No. Okay, so the the Netherlands and was actually a study abroad one. Um I was studying the healthcare system and then the uh, what is it? Jamaica is just like family and stuff like that. So none of those are vacations. <laughs> um, well, Let's let's broaden the question. What <laughs> what type of how you had a favorite vacation? I'm asking for the fillers because they okay. may want to, you know, put their hat in the ring. <laughs> okay. Know what I'm um, I I would say that probably like Puerto Rico was like a mini vacation, but not really. I wouldn't consider that a vacation, but. 
<laughs> Fellas, that means you do you do got a chance. You know, I don't know what you got to say to get her to reply. Um, I probably can give you some pointers on uh, if you want to try to stand out or whatever. But uh, you know, that's gonna be that's gonna cost you a consultation price right there. Uh, so. How was it working in finance at M&T Bank? Like, I know that's kind of like where the bulk of your experience came from. So how was it working in finance? Let me just take a step back. Um, I feel like that wasn't my, that wasn't my best, like, opportunity that I would say I enjoyed fully. I would say... I would say I did take a lot away from from the role from the company, but at the same time, there were things that I just did not resonate with. And I think, I don't know if it was being in finance or just the company or whatever, like I'm not gonna talk bad about it, but I just feel like, I just remember just being very overwhelmed and um, yeah, not feeling supported at times as well. So I, Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So not feeling supported at times. So I just feel like finance, the specific thing that I was doing, I, I didn't fully enjoy it. So I feel like each role that I had was an opportunity to take away, you know, starting from the target internship to even going to finance. Like I realized, okay, this is not for me, but this is what I can take away that I really enjoyed. And this is what I'm good at. Um, so I was able to gather all those different things and, um, and figure out, okay, well, I kind of want to go into tech and go into recruiting um, or account management. So I was able to take away from each of those roles and figure out what I wanted to do. All right. <laughs> oh, man. So what made you want to get out of finance and then go into big tech? Or how did that happen? Right. I think that's like a, a cool jump because I know for me, I went from working at a, a MSS where we had like a huge dedicated client into pretty much working in the financial sector. Um how did that, you know, go for you? How was that transition? Because for me, I know the one thing I do not like about finance, it's like so, when it comes to technology, it's so behind the times of what you have in other companies or you've been in more tech focused companies. I think that's one of the things that take them forever to adapt to change. And you're like, why are we doing stuff like this? It doesn't make sense. And it's a lot you know, other things I could talk about. Well, people can see them on like all my I quit videos or fintech experiences. But how do you feel about that transition from finance and kind of how did you, I guess, like discover the opportunity? Yeah. Um, first of all, I second that with the being behind in technology. Um, there was definitely a lot of that. Um, but how I got into tech was actually because I had a friend she got into Google and she, she, well, let's go back before she worked with me at m and bank. And she was like, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to Google. I'm like, okay, girl, like, go ahead. Like I, I never really understood like Google or anything, you know, in, in that realm of tech. So I was just like, okay, like go ahead, girl. So she went through the interview process and I helped prep her through the interview process. And then she eventually got in and became an account strategist at Google. And I'm like, dang, like, oh, that's amazing. So that inspired me. And I'm like, okay, let me look, start looking into tech companies and start applying. And I just remember being just paralyzed with anxiety for even applying to jobs back then. And I did not I did not send out a resume because I'm like, oh, what if I get rejected? And I feel like I was really in the thought process of like, oh, maybe I need to stay at this company that I really don't see a growth or, or future with um, because I was so scared of like just taking that leap of faith and jumping like she did. But, you know, she was really, really inspirational to me and for me. So then I started applying. And as soon as I started applying, I got my first rejection <laughs> uh, from Pinterest. And I was like, oh, okay, this isn't so bad. Like, you know, they, you know what they say, rejection is God's protection. So, you know, I got that rejection from Pinterest. I'm like, okay, this isn't 
so bad. Like, let me go ahead and start applying to other stuff. So then, you know, I applied to my current company and within three days of applying, they got back to me. They're like, yeah, we want to interview you for this account management program. And I was like, oh my God, I immediately called my friend um, from Google and she actually helped me prep for the interview because, you know, when you get that initial phone call, you're like, oh wow, like how, I don't want to mess this up. I want to make sure I go in there prepared. And the company I work at, like they have a very strict process of interviewing. So that's where I get all my interviewing, um, you know, like the tech interviewing, all that stuff. Like that's where I, I really fully understood the interview process, the star method and all these different things, because prior to that, I, I didn't fully understand it. Um, but yeah, I ended up interviewing and it was the longest interview of my life. <laughs> so I interviewed with six different people um, in the final rounds and then like three people in the phone screen and then the recruiter. It was just, it was so long. <laughs> so um, I eventually got in and, and that's how that happened with support, networking and friends. I briefly interviewed with AWS in 2021. Or it might have been, I think it was late 2021. And I really didn't prepare, to be honest. Uh, I messed up on like the leadership principle. I know for a fact, but I, at the time though, I was just like, why did he ask me about diversity? You know, I understood, but I kind of gave him still a good enough answer as far as like what I've been doing, like my personal life or my, my clients and all this other stuff. So I was just like, man, whatever. I, I felt like, why are you asking a black guy about diversity? I was like, my background didn't much on that. Like, ask me something else. But it is what it is. But this is the one thing I have not asked yet. And I do a bad job of this in all interviews because for me, I guess because I'm I'm a, a decade in, I'm not too much concerned about what you get paid. But I have to remember that a lot of, you know, entry level, mid level people watch this, whether they're in tech or they're trying to get into tech and they want to know about, you know, salaries that they could expect. Now, granted, I know it's probably I will say, I tell people all the time, like, you know, finance is pretty easy and they actually pay pretty decently for you being, you know, newer into corporate, but going to be, you know, account manager at, you know, Amazon. How was that, that pay jump or what could somebody expect to take a role like that? Like, you know, the pay jump was immaculate. I, I was, I thought I had to work years in my career before I even like saw that. Um, so I would say that just jumping from finance as a college student graduating, I was just like, oh, wow, like, you know, this is good. This is this is OK for where I'm at. But then when I got into tech, I, it just opened a whole new world, especially even being exposed to like the compensation um, for so many other different roles as well. Like it is. It, it, yeah. <laughs> All right. So when you did, when you were at the uh, the bank, what was that range like? You don't have to get specific. Yeah. I just want to kind of so, give them some numbers here to work with where they could kind of play around with their mind. Yeah. So the bank was more like, it was okay. It was like, uh, it was like, <laughs> no, the bank was like 70, 80 K like, yeah, base. So. That's 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 pretty good coming out of school, especially considering other, you know, places may not pay as much. That's why I do tell people about like finance, like finance going going to pay you decently. You're not going to get really any other, you know, incentives. So I think is my biggest issue about finance is like, why are y'all not offering people stock like the ones that's publicly traded? Why aren't y'all offering any equity? Um, but so, OK, so if that. All right. So if you was getting 70, 80. I'm assuming you took a large jump and you could just say TC so you don't have to say base because I kind of want you uh, as an account manager and recruiter to kind of break that part down too because a lot of people are sometimes confused when you say total compensation and, and how does it work and, and about negotiations and that's what we might go into right now. So let's talk about that jump and did you negotiate because I have I've, I just made a post the other day about on Twitter saying hey whatever you do don't you know don't accept the first offer and I have people saying like oh man I did it I, you know I had somebody like kind of scared not to negotiate because they're they're like well i don't have no experience i'm like hey like, they want you like negotiate because i guarantee somebody else probably got a little bit more experience than you and they 
for sure negotiated. So I want you to get all the money you can out of them because if you're expendable, if people remember that, they'll always try to, you know, finesse the companies like I tell them to. But yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, salary change, salary negotiation, and, and what that means for your breakdown over like your tenure at the company. Yeah. So in terms of salary change, I went from like that 80 80- K base to, you know, making six figures now, um, especially like going into sales account management, there is a lot of growth for that. Um, Especially, well, let's talk about total compensation and what that compensation breakdown looks like. And it might be different for every company, but, you know, in terms of like tech or like my specific company, it's base salary, stocks, and then also sign on payments and bonuses along with any types of commissions or things that come along with that. Um, so, you know, four different components of um, total compensation. So even if you get like a low quote unquote base salary, um, it can still be made up in other ways. So sometimes people are like, oh, like they're not giving me the money up front in, in the base. Like I can't take that. But at the same time, it's like, okay, you're making it up in other ways. Um, but for me, I, I had a, a really great, you know, base. I had a great um, sign-on payment was amazing. Uh, just like everything, just the package was amazing. But at the same time, I feel like they're never going to give you the what they can actually give you. Um, And I've seen that on the other side of, you know, recruiting and stuff like that. So they definitely have a range that they can give you and they can give you anywhere from the low end, the mid end or the high end of the range. So especially as someone from a marginalized community, black women, uh, people of color, it's so even like anyone, it's so important to negotiate because you never want to sell yourself short and just take the offer because you don't think that you can get anything else. You have to realize, because you said something earlier, you said, you know, you're, they, they, you're just as valuable to the company as the company is valuable to you. So you're bringing, there's a reason that, you know, they're bringing you into the companies because they, you need them and they need you, (laughs) you know? So it's that equal, someone is behind me, but it's that equal mutual um, benefit. But what I can say is, um, in terms of like total compensation, you really have to understand the breakdown and understand that you need to negotiate and you need to talk about um, why you're, you know, you're a great fit for the role as well as bringing in numbers and like um, competitive analysis of like what others are doing as well, as well as like what you see from the company and people in that role. So like levels FYI is like a great thing to understand, um, you know, to see what other people are making so that you can bring in all that valuable information and say, this is why I I think that you would benefit from increasing the, um, the compensation for me as well. I'm glad you said that though, because that's why I have to tell somebody um, in the DMs, I was like, show, tell them like why your value, you know, would, you know, command this much money on the market. And a lot of people do forget that. Like for me, I know I tell people all the time, they've seen my videos. I told them, hey, the current company, I, I took a pay cut to go there, but I was able to negotiate a good sign on. And I was so, listen, man, y'all just need to always tap into me. Like right now, I haven't told you I hit the like button, but please hit the like button join the Patreon. I'm always trying to get my free game. I was able to finesse the current company and my last company, right? Because now the good thing about Goldman Sachs was Goldman Sachs said, hey, regardless, if you start right here in this month, you're going to get your guaranteed bonus the next year of whatever. And so that amount was a bonus of like 30,000. Now that was pre-tax. The next company, when I went to them, I uh, agreed to like a higher base with a, a, a lower bonus amount. And so I was thinking I was going to get the whole bonus amount. It turned out they had it cut in half. So based on whatever the company did. So how I finessed that was while I was getting my offer and stuff ready, I got a person in uh, HCM to tell me when I signed on what was my uh, bonus amount because I needed it in writing to show the new company. And so when I had that, I was able to negotiate a comp buyout and a sign on uh, when I started. So that was the way how I made up for some stuff if I was to get a lot less money. I was like, everything can always be negotiated because a lot of times finance companies don't do a lot of sign-ons. Like they'll they'll do it because they, you know, 
what I came in as, if I would have got the same base, it would have put me at the top of the range, of course. So you know how that goes. Oh, well, we want room for you to grow, yada, 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 you know, the BS stuff. So that's how I was able to, to finesse that because, like, you know, I, I got the power here. <laughs> Y'all want me. <laughs> uh, so briefly, could you tell us, like, what the day in the life is like for an account management uh, account manager at Big Tech? It's a lot. <laughs> um a lot of it is meeting with businesses and advertisers. So basically what an account manager is, is someone who tries to help advertisers utilize our products so that they can expand awareness and drive loyalty and consideration for the products. So, you know, in terms of like account management and the day in the life, a lot of it is working with account executives to create slides, to look at data, to understand, you know, what are they currently doing and what do they need to do to meet their goals? And they're the ones setting their goals so that, and you're utilizing the products and services to help them meet that. Um, So that's, that's account management, but a lot of it is just like, you know, staying up, look at, look, looking at data analysis, looking at different advertisers and, and um, books of businesses and seeing what, what products they've implemented and trying to find opportunities to upsell and um, find opportunities to just really help them reach their goals. Um, and then, you know, presenting that to them, getting that, getting them, um, you know, on track with those goals and with the products and getting them to invest in those products and seeing the value and why they should be investing in those products. Um, so like, that's a lot of it. And, and, you know, going back and seeing, looking at the campaigns that they ran and see, did, did it run engagement? Did it increase engagement? Or if not, like what happened? Why? Um, so really understanding the why behind that data. And like I was talking about Target, like, that's where I got like the, my first taste of like looking at data and all that stuff um, in the corporate environment. What type of experience would someone need in order to do a role like yours? Like what would they need if they want to say, hey, I want to be an account manager, like, you know, soft skills, technical skills, software. What, what would they need to know? They would need to have a customer first mindset um, because you know a lot of times people are like oh like i have just like a customer service experience sorry for the noise by the way i'm like in the room. um so i have to have a customer service can you, can you hear noise like background noise okay so yeah so You have to have a customer first mindset to understand, okay, what are their goals? What are they doing? Um, And really trying to like be really invested in, in how you can help them grow. Um, So problem solving skills is really, really important because not only do you have to just look at the data, you have to understand, you know, why do they have a dip at certain points, like, and then pulling in different, um, you know, stories and, and cases. Um, and storytelling is also really important, being able to go back to stakeholders and, and tell them, like, you know, the reason why, you know, this kind of dropped or this is doing really well is because, um, you know, maybe prime day or maybe this day like certain things um going on economically can be impacting um you know your your numbers and your revenue so storytelling problem solving skills communication um being able to make a really good slide and convincing them negotiating closing deals um all those things are are very important as well dope dope all right so let's let's get spicy real quick, right? Earlier on, we we're talking about you know being a recruiter, being an applicant. What are some misconceptions that job applicants have about the, you know, the the job search process? As far as when they are applying for a role, or either they're interviewing, what are some misconceptions that they have on their end that you can probably help clear up? Yeah. Um, they probably the first thing is they think that the recruiter is kind of in charge of. The decision, the recruiter is like a messenger. They are the ones, the midpoint between the hiring manager and the 
the job seeker. So we're like the gatekeepers. So we're in charge of like sending hiring managers your resume. We're not necessarily saying yes or no, like, um, you know, you can move forward. Like we don't really have much of a say except for like in the phone screen process. But aside from that, like the hiring managers are making the key decisions in terms of like whose resume to move forward. Like, of course, like we find the people and we send it to the hiring managers like we do have a stake in that but at the same time they're like they're the ones in charge of like who are the ones that we're hiring and then the team also makes the, makes the decision and another mixed misconception is um the fact that probably like thinking that one interview skill works for all companies. I think when you're interviewing, you're going to have to understand how various different companies conduct interviews because how you interview at Google is not how you interview at Amazon, how you interview at Amazon is not how you interview at Meta. So really like diving deep and understanding like the specific companies, like what they're looking for is, is essential. Um, and then what else? In terms of like, oh, last thing, debriefs. So recruiters are in the debriefs, listening in the conversations with hiring managers. Um, and what a debrief is, if you don't know, that's basically after you go through the interview process, like we sit back and we talk about the candidate and, and decide whether or not we want to move forward with them. So that's where everybody talks about, okay, what did this person do well? What didn't they do well? Um, can we actually see them on the team? Stuff along those lines. So in, in terms of misconceptions, it's like, yes, we do sit down and we do talk and we do know what answers you gave to certain people and what answers you didn't give. So just make sure that you're diversifying your answers as well is going to be important. That's dope. I know that'll definitely help some people out. Now let's get into some spicy topics, right? We have, like I said, TikTok, social media, a whole bunch of BS information out there. How do you feel about people lying on their resume? And I want to clarify this. Embellishing and lying are two different things. An embellishment is, you know, you might, you might have did, you might have successfully led like, you know, three projects. You might say, you know, successfully led like eight projects. It's kind of like an embellishment. I mean, ain't nobody finna really see if you did eight. Now, a straight out lies that you ain't led nothing at all. You said you, you know, successfully led like 20 projects and whatever you did with that. Like, so how do you feel about lying? And can, and also this is the thing too, because I've been in the interview process as far as like people want to interview at the company and I'm part of the, the technical team, maybe that's conducting the interviews and looking at the resume. I know how to spot BS and that's outside of me even just doing my career coach stuff. Can recruiters automatically spot BS on resumes? And what are red flags that you guys see on resumes? I think this is going to be really perfect for the audience. Sure. We can spot BS. Um, and I do want to go back to your point of embellishment versus lying. If you're flat out lying and saying, you know, you worked at a specific company that you didn't work on, like work at, like that's lying. Um, and, you know, we do run background checks and we do see that information. So like, that's the part, like, don't lie about that. Um, in terms of like embellishment, I think it's like, how much do you embellish? Because I feel like you, different titles at, are at different companies. So say if, you know, I'm a recruiter at, my company right and then i go to a different company and they have i'm applying for a job that says talent acquisition specialist i'm not gonna put recruiter i'm gonna put talent acquisition specialist even like that's what i've done like if i have things from that job that i've done that's who i am and that's the approach i took um i was talking to this other lady at my job she's like a program manager and she was like yeah like put program manager if you've done things in program management as well um and if you don't feel comfortable doing that you can put like whatever your actual job title is slash the you know title that you're applying for as long as you've done it before um so i feel like there's a certain extent to what you can change and what you shouldn't change um and those are like the obvious like the company the amount of time like the length of time that you work there or like sometimes the numbers um, can be embellished a little bit, but at the same time, it's like, if it's outrageous, like you can spot whether or not it's bullshit, um, especially the hiring managers. They're like, yeah, this makes no sense. And they will call you out on that in the interview process as well. 
Yeah, definitely. I was talking to somebody in, in my my DMs about that, and they were talking about, you know, I guess. And this was the thing I was telling them about. It's like, you know, people will be laid off and maybe they didn't put the end date on their resume. That's a red flag for her. And I was saying, for me, it's not. I mean, this whole job search process is a, is a marketing thing. Some, Not all companies, but some companies will try to prey upon you being laid off and try to give you any type of offer and do you any type of way. Versus, hey, once you get in the, the interviews and they start asking about your experience, you say, you know, well, you know, I was laid off because of, you know, yada, yada, yada. Or a lot of times in the job application, you can state like, oh, no, I was actually laid off on, you know, this day and this is why I do the organizational restructuring or this or that. And that's fine. But I was like, on a resume, I'm not like too concerned, like with you saying, oh, you know, this is the day it ended. Because some people have got in a month and then got laid off. So putting that on the resume sometimes may be like, well, why did they only be here for a month? Sure be things, but sometimes people will look at it like too crazy. So I, I was like, the only red flag for me was like, you know, uh, like you said, I've had people be a help desk worker, but then try to change their job to security specialist. I'm like, bro, you're doing help desk stuff. Like, stop capping. If you didn't do the job, don't put that on there. But if you did specific elements of it, you can, you know, try to do that. Big facts. Like, I've had people, like, I have help desk people, like I was telling you about um, a guy with his years of experience and now what he's getting, like, interviewing for. And he does stuff that's similar to like, you know, uh, identity access management or uh, system administration or whatever. So I've actually did titles like that where that is an embellishment. However, the job functions that they are doing are serving the functions of those other roles. Like the only reason why it's help desk because that can that is a way for them to say, you know, we're going to pay them this much because this is what we pay help desk to the companies. And so those are the things I do try to get people to understand when we start taking their resume and I look at the titles. Like, I was like, no, you've been doing this, this and this. This is what we're going to call this role. So that's cool. I wanted to ask you something about like two things, like fake certifications, because I know I don't know if you were around when you about the PMP plug when they was talking about getting fake PMPs, and then you know what people a lot of people have been encouraging people to do fake degrees because they're saying, oh well, these companies didn't even check if their degree was real or not, and all these different things. The thing is, my issue is always when it's us saying that it's bad because we already have to be better than everybody else anyway. So convincing us to take shortcuts doesn't give us long term career success because a lot of these people who are giving this advice, not even not doing the role like they're not recruiters, they're not TA, they're not human resources. I'm, I'll have to show you. I'll even show you the person's page after this. But they do none of these things and they're giving people advice and they think it's like what it's supposed to be. And it's only because in today's time, only everything that's true is unpopular opposed to stuff I can just say to make you feel good. And I just spit some BS out and, and tell you apply to a thousand, a thousand roles and you'll probably find like a, a good paying job, or whatever. Like they, these, this is some of the stuff that's going out here now, or like people just manipulating stuff in the, in their resumes are basic. They never worked in tech roles or especially technical tech roles at that. Like there's even a difference with that. I've had people Come up to me, and I don't even subscribe to be the best resume writer. Uh, most of my resumes are built off the template of like my resume that helps me interview at other places. But I know how to write them when it comes to tech specific roles because those are roles that I apply to. Well, some people have not wrote, written enough of those resumes as professional resume writers, and therefore they write in people in effect of resumes. And so these are the things that are happening too when people are going to spend like a lot of money. Like the resume looks good, but it's not what we're looking for in a technical resume on top of people looking at probably like hundreds of resumes a day. They only got six, seven, eight seconds to look at it. But I said all that crap to say, how do you feel about fake degrees? And have you ever dealt with like a candidate or somebody that lied about a degree? Um, I feel like you should not do it because at the end of the day, like I said, there are things like background checks that happen. And regardless, even if the background check did not happen, especially if you're telling me like not even just degree, but like people are lying about PMP certifications. I think that you're only doing this to see yourself a disservice because when you actually get into that job, like it's one thing to get to that job and you're like, oh my God, I'm so excited. Like, you know, but you have to remember, you have to do the job. <laughs> you have to actually do the job. So like lying about a PMP certification or like a degree um, can really hold you back in a sense, like, 
you know, if you haven't even worked in that specific type of role before and you're just like, yeah, like here's my PMP certification and you know nothing about it, like you're only messing yourself up in the end. Um, so I just feel like you shouldn't even bother to do that. I think just take the long route and actually get it because you're giving yourself information that you might need um, and you're learning um, different things that you might need that's going to help you in the future. So like, there's no reason to lie. Um, that's just my take on it. Don't don't lie. And I, I don't know who these people are lying about or telling people to lie um, about certifications and degrees because they're messing them up or even doing resumes if they don't even understand the resume. Like, I don't know. I, I just don't agree with that. You'll be surprised. Like I said, like I try... Uh, on TikTok, like my kind of my creed is like if it's women with the misinformation, I won't kind of just go straight at them because I don't want to say, "Oh, you attacking women." Like, you can't really have a sound point and a, attack someone's point anymore, especially if you're a man. So I try to lead it. Okay, <laughs> we'll talk about it. Yeah, so, right. So I, I typically just leave that for the ladies to to get on their yeah. cases and, and not me, but. One of the other questions I want to ask you about is uh, the elephant in the room, artificial intelligence, AI, when it comes to job search. How do you feel about it? How do you feel about it enhancing the job search? Uh, I'll give you a little bit of kind of like a little bit of how I feel about it right now is I think it could be beneficial. I still think there's things that AI doesn't know about resumes that it still needs to be tweaked by a human. So it sometimes it does good with like, you know, traditionally like helping writing stuff, but there's still some things it doesn't know to add because one, it doesn't have access to data, prison data now and certain words that you need to use or trying to show that this and these other things. But I do think it could be beneficial in some ways. But and from your experience, I remember you shared, matter of fact, let's do this because you shared this on TikTok the other day. I want you to give your opinion on that. And then what are some AI job search sites or AI tools that the listeners can use to help them in their job search? So my view on it, I feel like AI can be very, very helpful in your job search, but you also have to not rely and use it as a crutch. And what I mean by that is like, it's a great resource to understand, okay, what, what things should I highlight that I'm not highlighting in my resume? What are things that I should um, add that I'm not adding or things I'm overlooking in the job description that I'm not adding? But I feel like, especially like with ChatGPT or, you know, any of the other, like even kick resume sometimes, like they don't give you the best type of templates and they don't give you like the exact things that you should necessarily put on your resume. And I want to make a video on that in the future, like use it with a grain of salt. I think it's just like a certification. It's giving you a framework of what exactly your resume should have, but you're not going to use whatever they give you step by step by step like that's not the exact thing that that you're going to use you're just going to use it to set up your resume um, and for people who don't know how to really do a resume or what should be looked for in a resume it can be difficult to differentiate like okay maybe i should add this or maybe remove this so i think like ai is a great i think it's great in its own sense but there is a lot that still needs to be developed in order for people to literally take copy and paste word by word, like there needs to be a lot done, but I think that you can utilize it to figure out, okay, what are things that are missing in my profile or in my, you know, resume that I can make it better. So that's my thought on that. In terms of like specific AI websites, definitely I would say like ChatGPT, I know <laughs> that one, I it's, it's definitely overused, but I feel like it's, it's really great to ask questions that you can see, okay, hey, like what skills should I add or what are things I need to highlight in the job description or, you know, give me information about X, Y, Z, like whatever. Um, so I think ChatGPT, if you know how to use it well, then um, that could be a great tool. Kick Resume, it can do like the AI generation. Um, you know, it can create templates for you on your behalf. Um, I think that's a good one. But at the same time, I don't love every single template that it has because I feel like some of them are too colorful or like it's just too much going on. So like 
having a simple template, the simpler it is, the better. Um, and not necessarily saying color is bad, like color is okay, but I'm saying like when you have just too much going on, um, that's where it gets kind of iffy. Um, what else? Teal, Teal is a great website. Um, I think, yeah, I think Teal is actually one of the better ones because it works closely with AI, but you can also like have a scan the job description so that, you know, you can figure out what words come show up the most and what words you need to highlight the most. I, I think that's important. Um, and then also like it can serve as a job search tracker for you so you can keep track of all the jobs that you're applying for. Um, change your resume for each job I, and use AI to change your resume. I think, you know, those are the top three that I would recommend right now. Um, but yeah, if you have any recommendations, that'll be great too. Like, I think this AI thing is like, is, is, is super new as well. So. No, we've been here a, a while and I appreciate you for coming on the show today. What would be like three things you would want to leave maybe the listeners with when they're going through, you know, this career journey, they're in college, wherever they're at listening right now, what would be three things that you would give them to keep, keep them be encouraged and help them out in this, you know, this time that they're trying to like, you know, make the best out of their situation? Number one, be patient with yourself. It takes time. It's okay if you don't have a job right now. Like the economy is just everything. There are a lot of people looking for jobs. So be patient with yourself and be kind to yourself, especially during this time. Like though that's like my number one thing. And that's what my channel is all about. Like, you know, it, this whole thing is a process. And even whether or not we're going through this economic change or whatever, um, it's still a lot to even gather the courage to apply for a job and even be rejected for multiple jobs. Like it's a lot and it takes a lot. Um, the, la the second thing I would say is gather your resources and utilize your resources. You have so much um, resources out there, whether it's AI, whether it's the internet, like you can learn what you need to do and change. Um, and you have TikTok as well. TikTok is taking the world by a storm. So that's a great thing as well. And then the last thing is um, just do your research and don't trust everything that you see on the internet as well. Like make sure that you really understand what you're getting into for each and everything that you do. Um, so do your research and understand things for yourself. Um, you know, whether you should get a certification or not, do that like research on your own um, to figure that out. That's cool. And where can our listeners, where can they follow you at? They can follow me while using career therapy. That is my um, TikTok handle. Uh, so career therapist and, or you can just search in Venetia K. Okay. That's dope. And I also have her socials in the description so you can follow her. Guys, I really appreciate y'all for tuning into this episode. And if you made it to the end of this episode and you want a part two, please let me know because we kind of got a little rush today. It's like just one of those hectic Wednesdays, but um, we can always run this back on a live stream, whether it be on TikTok or YouTube, you name it. But if you guys want that, go ahead and um, leave a number two in the comments if you if you want another one of these. And uh, also, like I tell you guys, you know, I always read the last rule of the rule book or your head will be shaved. And uh, until next time, let's stay textual and we are out. <laughs>